Hi, I'm Rachel Gardner and I'm really pleased that I can just bring a few thoughts to you about relationships. So a couple of weeks ago, I sent a WhatsApp message to some of the older youth at our church in Preston Minster because they had been so amazing all during lockdown on our Love Your Neighbour project. Like they've been rocking up, cooking hot dinners for homeless people, um, delivering care packages for vulnerable families. And I just, I'd been so moved, like working alongside them, just seeing the ways that they were prepared to turn up, like to use their bodies to care for the most vulnerable in our community. So I was like, come on guys, let's meet up now that lockdown is easing and let's have a socially distanced lunch. Except the problem is, when I sent the message, it auto-corrected and it said, hey guys, why don't we all just meet up at church for a sexually distanced lunch? And you can imagine the complete barrage of abuse that I got back from them. And one guy was like, Rachel, because I'm a Christian, it's always relationship lockdown central here and I'm always having a sexually distanced lunch. And we had like a really interesting conversation about like, what does it actually mean for us as Christians to, to live free and well in terms of our relationships, like to know life in all its fullness, um, not just like when we're singing songs in worship, but like in the nitty gritty everyday stuff, when we're thinking about our sexuality, when we're thinking about our relationships, and we're thinking about sex and all that stuff, like, what does it mean to use our bodies in a way that honour Jesus? Like I'd loved how these young people had used their bodies to literally go and chat with homeless people that nobody else wants to get anywhere close to. I love the way that many of them like put, went along to um, to the uh, anti-racist marches or just like showed up in their friends' lives and said, listen, I'm not just gonna be anti-racism, I'm gonna be your ally and, like, and, and use my body to speak against injustice when I see it. Um, and I love the way also that they are seeking to use their bodies in their relationships, in their intimate relationships to honor Jesus, that that most private part of their lives, their sexuality, their desires, their loves, their hopes for their future. They're willing to bring even that to Jesus and to surrender that to him. I just think it's incredible. When Jason, my husband and I were first married, uh, we uh, went for, we used to love going for walks around lakes. Well, I say we loved it. I mean, in theory, I love the great outdoors, in theory. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's beautiful. Bit of trees, bit of woods, bit of mountains. In, the in theory, it's great, but in practice, I'm a woman who loves to wear footwear like this. And, and footwear like this doesn't really mix with like, lakes and lake district. I also have this deep belief that wet weather gear comes from the pit of hell and like walking boots are designed by demons or something. So I'm not a natural fit. Like, <laughs> but Jason and I would dutifully do these walks. And there was one particular day at the beginning of our marriage where it was raining, nobody else was around. And we were like walking around, I think it was Buttermere Lake. And we were just coming down off, off, off the mountainside, the hillside. Um, and I was moaning for Britain, like, there's no Starbucks anywhere, and my feet hurt, and my hair's going frizzy. And we were just coming down the side of the valley, and I could see that the wind was really churning up the waters of the lake. And as we got to the bottom of the, of the valley, uh, the bottom of the hill, and sort of stepped out to the side of the lake, the wind just like whipped off the lake and, and picked me up into the air and, and smashed me back down on the ground. I used the word smashed. I was absolutely fine. There was absolutely no problem at all. I was fine. And also I hadn't been drinking. But I was just like, oh, I'm going to lie on the floor and make my husband suffer because he's made me walk. And he was like, that's your comeuppance, Rachel, for being such a nag. And he eventually stopped laughing and grabbed hold of me and dragged me behind this really big tree for protection. And as I stood there, like being really annoyed with him and bruising, like a bruised ego, I stood there and thought, Do you know, this is a little bit like an illustration for life. Like there are times in life where there are things that happen that can threaten to take us out. Things that are so powerful, so overwhelming. And it could be like, a great loss or a bereavement. It could be a great disappointment. It could be an overwhelming feeling. It could be a longing and a hope that you have, but things that can be so overwhelming and you're not sure as you face it what you're supposed to be doing. And, and in those times, God says to us, I'm like a, sh a tree sheltering you in the storm. Like whatever it is that you're facing, coming out of lockdown, with your relationships and your sexuality in general, whatever the big questions are, whatever your hopes and your hurts, like if you're feeling that you're lying on the ground, not knowing how to get up and not knowing what to do in the face of this, 
I want you to know I'm a big tree in front of you. I'll shelter you from the storm. But there are other times where, like for my husband, he's bigger, he's stronger, he's got a big pointy beard, a shaved head, and he puts his food where he can see it. Like, the winds took me out, but it didn't take Jace out. Like, he could stand in the face of that storm and kind of eye eyeball it and say, yeah, you're strong, I, I can withstand this one. And that's the other beautiful thing, that knowing God at work in our life by his spirit, there are times where he just wants to gather around us and put people around us and help us put boundaries in place that act like that buffer, that protection. But there are other times where he says, come on on your feet, stand up. You got this one. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you, you got this one. Like, this stuff that feels overwhelming. I'm working in your life. Like, we can, we can face this together. So... Really, that's my heart. I'm going to share just three very brief little ideas. But my heart for you is that you will know that you are free and, and strong. That, that more than anything, God wants you to be free. Free from obsessive thoughts and obsessive behaviours around relationships, about who you think you should be, how you think you should perform and fit in. Maybe obsessive thoughts and behaviours around sex, around like some, you've started doing something but it's become quite habitual and it's difficult to get free. He wants you to know you can be free from that. Free from the despair that nobody would ever want to be with you. Free from the lies that would tell you you need to be like this or like that. Free from the shame that would say, you've done what? Oh my goodness, God doesn't love you. That God wants you to know that you can be free. But also that you can be strong. That actually it's possible to live for Jesus and to know that freedom, even in situations where we're like, wow, I had no idea that actually I could sort of be here and still live for Jesus. I am. Um, I remember years ago, the very first person that I ever went out on a date with, I know we don't always use the word date, but this first guy that I dated, I, I just had no idea what I was supposed to, I think about 15, had no idea what I was supposed to do. I'm not just talking about sex, I'm just talking about like, like we're going we're going out like what what is that what are we supposed to do and i think i was probably the most disastrous person he ever went out with because i just was like i went from being this bubbly fun loving carefree girl to suddenly like oh no you you want to be with me so I, there's an expectation on me to be like ultra amazing and it just shut me down like i was like oh no i can't handle this i can't handle this and because of that, I found that actually the relationship began to be a relationship that I just didn't want to be in. And, and, I'm, and I felt as well, this was a relationship that Jesus didn't want me to be in. Not because this guy was bad, but because he was making all the decisions and I was just going along with it because I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And I've just learned through my many, many years of mistakes and and picking myself up and knowing Jesus with me that he not only wants me to know that I'm free, but he wants to know that he's equipping me with the ability and capacity to make really wise choices that honour him and honour others and, and honour my body. Paul, who was a church planter, who wrote a lot of the New Testament, which is the second part of the Bible, he says this in one of his letters in Colossians 1, 10 to 12. He says, may you live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share. And basically what Paul is saying is, I think he's saying, like when you said yes to following Jesus, you didn't suddenly get this download that said, we're now going to make sure that in your brain is everything that you have to do. So if you're ever in any sticky situation or in any overwhelming situation, just press a certain button and you will automatically know what to do and do the right thing. That's not what happens. Paul is saying, look, as you take one faltering step after the other, as you say, Jesus, please show up in my life and be with me and shelter me and hold me. That actually what happens is bit by bit, we do that hard work of saying, God, where are you? God, be with me. God, please help me to honour you. That actually over time we grow strong. And over time we know quicker and quicker and quicker what it is that God would have us do. And over time we get to know ourselves. And over time we surrender more and more of this incredible life and body God has given us. We surrender it to him and we know life in all its fullness. So here are three thoughts for you. Number one, step in. Step in. You belong to God. 
There is absolutely no point, me or anybody, or even yourself, coming up with a list of do's and don'ts about how you can honour God in your relationships if we don't first get the whole thing in our head and our heart that we belong, that this, this is never a condition of us belonging. God doesn't go, well, let me just see how you get on over the next couple of years, and if there aren't too many mistakes then you're in. Like, God is like, no, the moment you say yes to my son, the moment you look to me, the moment you dare to open your arms to me, I'm all in, I'm up there for you, I'm in your career, I'm not going anywhere. And, and, and then the change happens is that rather than thinking, I've got to sort out all my questions and concerns and fears and hopes about relationships, and then God will love me. What we realise is actually God is right with us, wanting to help us in that. So Visualise this for a moment. Imagine... You're right over here, God's right over there, and, and you're like, God, I just feel like I'm, I'm supposed to be in a relationship. I just feel that nobody wants to be with me, and, and I, I just think it's a sign that I'm unlovable, and, and I don't know what to do here. And, and God is right over there, and you're right over here, and, and somehow you feel that you've got to get that right for God to get close to you. But actually what happens is this. You can now see that, I, you know. I got lipstick on my teeth. Loads of lines everywhere. Thank you, Jesus, for getting older. I love it. Get older with pride. But you get really close and you say, God, I know that you're here and that I already belong to you. And you know what's hurting me right now. And, and you know the, the lie inside me is saying that I've got to deal with this on my own, but Jesus, I can't deal with this without you. You know, I think in the relationship... I don't know what is the right thing to do about whether to have sex or not, or, or, or how much, how far is too far. I, I don't know. I don't know that. God, please help me bring that to you, and, and please speak to me, and please make it really obvious in my heart and in my gut that how I can honour you. Like I want to honour you. And do you see what I'm saying? Like it's different, isn't it? It's different from I've got this problem. Uh, God, over here to God, you're right here with me. So, so step in, step, bring it, and and maybe you need like a youth worker or a friend to like do that with you. Like one of the greatest honours of being a youth worker is is being invited into that space with a young person and saying that is incredible that you are inviting Jesus to speak into this, and and I and I want to just pray with you and and encourage you in that. So don't do that alone. So step in, number one, number two, step out. Step out, like you can trust God. Like the, the one thing that we know about following Jesus is that it, it's always a radical encounter with someone that changes our lives and asks us to live in ways that don't always make sense to culture. Like if there's something radical, we can, we can trust God. And the same is true with our relationships. Um, like I, I know, there's an amazing couple at our church, a young couple at the moment who, you know, they, their whole thing during lockdown is um, we, we're not going to move in together. They're kind of, they're, they're sort of at that age where one of them could have said to their parents, look, can my boyfriend like move in with us for lockdown? They're sort of age 18, 19, that kind of age, like where they're making their own decisions. But they made the decision not to do that not knowing how long they would not see each other. I mean, how, how radical is that? How trusting is that? So they went into lockdown going, we're not gonna, we're not gonna like be under the same roof. We're gonna keep our relationship going by phoning each other, writing to each other. When they were able to do it, they, they met like at a distance across the garden chatting. I mean, I'm, I just was listening like, that's so romantic. They're like, yeah, you try doing it. I was like, oh, you're right. Um, and then they can now do like socially distance walk. It's been amazing. But how trusting is that, that they said, do you know what? We trust God that, that what we see in scripture is that God is faithful in all his relationships and, and we, we need to be faithful in ours. And we believe as a, as a couple that actually that sexual intimacy is his most beautiful gift for, for when we've promised to be together for life in front of God and in front of others and we get married. So at the moment, that's, that's not happening for us, but we're going to have like loads of other like physical experiences of hugging each other, kissing, cuddling, holding, but, but we're not going to have genital sexual activity. Sorry for putting out the genital word there. Um, but that, that is trust, isn't it? Like you can trust God with decisions that... Maybe your friends and culture say, why are you making such a deal of this? I mean, that's the irony of culture, isn't it? 
that sex, the messaging culture is sex doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just get over it. But, but next to the sex doesn't matter is the assumption that therefore you should be having lots of sex and a certain kind of sex. And, and it's, a, it's a really toxic combination. But when we step back from that as Christians and say, listen, I'm free from that. I'm free from that rat race, that performance narrative. I'm, I'm free to trust God that it's okay if we're not having sex in our relationship. It's okay for us to take it slow. It's okay at the moment I'm single. It's okay that I've not dated many people. It's okay that there's other bigger things in my life right now. It's okay that I'm just giving myself time to ask the big questions. I, I trust God with this. So number one, step in. Number two, trust God. And number three, step up. Be part of the revolution. Step up. Be part of the revolution. And, and I... I want to encourage you, if this interests you and if this resonates with you, I want to encourage you to set yourself some unshakable unbreakables. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, get, get really detailed about, about like, what's the vision that, that you have for how you want to use your body and how you view your sexuality and how you view your relationships. Like, get really Focus with Jesus about that. Talk to him about that. Go on some long walks with God about that. Look through scripture. Ask God, what is your dream for how I live? Like, we are not spirits floating around or minds floating around. We are bodies as well. God has given us a body. We, we use our bodies to influence and, and shape culture, to bring change, to inspire people that there is a, a, a different way to live. And and one of the great gifts of the Holy Spirit, I believe, as well as joy, love, peace, patience, is self-control. Now hear me, self-control is not repression. Repression is where you say, I'm feeling hungry, but I'm going to ignore that and just ignore that and, and just carry on if that doesn't exist. That's not, that is not self-control, that's repression. Self-control is, I, I'm feeling hungry, so I'm going to listen to that. And I'm, and I'm going to recognise I have a number of options. I could go out and get a dirty big Big Mac. And sometimes, lovely, brilliant. But if I only feed this hunger with a dirty big Big Mac, then actually I'm going to kind of like, yeah, I won't be flourishing. I won't be firing all cylinders. So, so I'm, I'm recognising my hunger, but I'm also recognising I have choices and options about what I do, how I feed that hunger. And self-control is saying, I have sexual urges. I have longing for relationship. I have longing for romance or whatever, however you might want to phrase it, because we're all so different. Like, but I have, a, I have longings and desires I'm going to recognize them. I'm going to acknowledge them. I'm going to thank God that he's given me a body that feels things and my emotions. And I'm going to bring that to God and say, God, will you help me now know how to, how to meet that need? Where to go to meet that need? And, and that, it sounds so subtle. It doesn't sound world-changing, but it is incredibly world-changing to be an individual, a human that says, Jesus, I'm going to surrender everything to you, which doesn't mean I'm going to pretend that I'm not me. I'm going to really understand me. I'm going to really like learn about relationships. I want to be like the person, that if I date somebody, I am so selfless in that relationship. I love them in the way that you love them. I honor them in the way that you honor them. I'm going to give all of this to you because I want you to shape my life because you're the author of my life. So if I want to know life in all its fullness, you are, you've got to be in that picture. Like you're the frame, you're the great architect, you're the artist. And, and, and instead of that being leaving yourself on the shelf, it, it, that is an invitation to you to step into life that you've never dreamed of. To dare to believe that pursuing relationships God's way will bring life to you and to community around you. So lots, lots and lots of thoughts there. The main overriding thing is you are loved, you are precious, you are loved, you are precious, you are in, you are loved, you are precious. Bring all of this to God because the Bible tells us that you are somebody important already wants to be with you. Like you are already somebody that somebody amazing wants to be with. That key relationship, if you know Jesus, is yours forever. You are already loved. You are already home. You are already held. Now, 
take hold of this incredible life God give you and see what God can do with it. Thank you.